I've lived in 20 different countries. I've been called stupid Armenian, dog. I couldn't say even a word. But in this country, I found out that nobody could come to me and say, look, you stupid Armenian. They might call me a stupid man, and they'd be right too, believe me, in many cases. But at least in England, that you can remain a good Armenian and at the same time be a good British subject. And one does not create a contrast with the other. They can go harmoniously hand in hand with each other. Azadur Guzelian settled in Britain in 1964. For his wife, Vivian, it was a smooth transition after a childhood spent in British India. But for Azadur, as for so many Armenians, it marked the end of half a lifetime of wandering. I was born in a small village in Turkey, which was, of course, up to the 14th century Cilicia, or Lesser Armenia, what they termed it as. I was born in 1932. According to my father, the year it snowed very heavily and our cow died. It was a beautiful village, hidden in the mountains, forests, vineyards, and I remember my father telling me that you could ride for six hours and you wouldn't come to the end of our vineyards. It's so big. But unfortunately, my father only knew about land. He never thought about keeping money. So therefore, when in 1939, we left our village, which up to then was under French rule, it was given back to the Turks. We didn't have a penny except my mother's jewelry and 22 cows. Half of them died on the way, and the ones that reached to Lebanon were not worth anything to sell for because they were skin and bone only. But I was so happy when my father told us that we are leaving this country and we are going to take a boat. First, we were going on trucks to the harbor, Alexandretta, and from there we were going to Lebanon. Of course, I was only six and a half. I was so happy. But my father, on the other hand, was cursing the British, the Americans, the French, and he was cursing even God. And I couldn't understand this. I really couldn't understand it. I said, why is he cursing? We're taking this lovely trip, and he, he is cursing. Later on, of course, when I went to school, I studied history. I agreed with my father that the Armenians, once again, were betrayed by the great powers, and they had again to leave their country and became refugees to the neighboring countries in the Middle East. So first we were brought by the French to a place called Sur, which is Cyrus. Um, it was malaria infested place. It was full of snakes and scorpions. Everybody was sick. I was even bitten by a scorpion, and if it wasn't for my brave mother sucking my blood immediately, cutting it with a knife and sucking, I would have been dead. So my father eventually said, look, we've lost everything. We are not going to stay here. So whatever we had, we collected, and we decided to go to Syria, to Aleppo, because people came from Aleppo, and they said that life was cheaper there. So we started packing up and going to Aleppo. The war started. And there was no bread, we didn't have much money. And I used to go to school only five months in the year. The balance I used to spend in the Kurdish mountains, collecting olives, <laughs> believe it or not, from six o'clock in the morning to seven o'clock at night, right from the age of seven. I, in fact, never had a childhood, to be very frank with you. Of course, every Armenian child heard about the massacres. This tremendous tragedy that had happened to the Armenians. But it didn't register much until I was about 15 years of age when I heard that I had a sister about whom my mother had never spoken to me. And I forced her to tell me the story, what happened to my sister. And my mother told me 
that in 1915 all the Armenians were deported from their homes in the Ottoman Empire and were sent to the desert, Arabian desert, which is known as Der El Zor. And as the Turks did not want to use any bullets on them to waste, they let them die in the desert. And whilst walking towards the desert, uh, my sister, who was then six years old, couldn't walk anymore. Her feet swell and was bleeding, and she was falling down, and the caravan of these miserable human beings was going forward, Then the Turkish soldiers were beating them. So a soldier came and told my mother, carry on. And my mother said, I can't carry on because my child is bleeding. So there and then he bayoneted her on the spot. And when I heard this story, then I realized how terrible it must have been, not only for my mother, but for thousands and thousands of other mothers who lost their children in the desert. I almost matured all of a sudden after hearing that story. I was no more a child, I was a grown-up man. My desire was to get a higher education, but we did not have money. So my principal in the school told me, would you go to the seminary? I said, what seminary? He said, there is a seminary, Armenian seminary in Lebanon, where you can get free education. It's a marvelous education. So he gave me a letter. I went to Lebanon to this seminary. I went to the principal. He said, I'm sorry, my son, but we have this year's budget is over. We cannot take you. So I came to uh, Beirut to my uncle's house, I slept the night and I thought to myself, so what am I supposed to do now? Am I going to become mechanic like my brothers? So eventually I decided to get up. I didn't even have money to take a taxi because it was seven kilometers, so I walked seven kilometers. I arrived there at eight o'clock and I sat on the steps. The principal came, he said, are you here again? I said, yes. He said, but I told you we cannot take you. But I said, sir, I want to study. I haven't got money. I said, I'm so sorry, but please go, I'm busy. Well, I walked back seven kilometers. I went to my uncle and said, what happened? I said, well, they wouldn't take me. He says, go back to Aleppo and find work as a tailor, barber, anything. He says. So I decided that I should try once again. So I went next day and he saw me there. He says, are you here again? I said, yes, sir. He says, all right. Come with me, I have to take you to His Holiness, the Catholicos. He's the only one who can overrule me. So I went there on the way. I didn't know even how to address to His Holiness. I said, excuse me, how do you say? Well, how do I address to His Holiness? He said, well, you say, uh, God be with you. I went there and here was this impressive old man with beard, very kind eyes. So he called me to him. He said, son, do you want to study? I said, yes, Your Holiness. He said, all right, to the principal. He said, take examination from this child. I think God helped me there. Uh, I passed everything grade one, even mathematics that I couldn't do at school. So when I went back, when we went back to His Holiness and the report was handed to him, he said to the principal, he said, this boy will be my boy. I shall pay for him. Go and buy a bed for him and sent his accounts to me. That's how I became His Holiness's protégé, so-called. Well, I graduated seminary uh, in 1955, but I did not have money to go to university. I did not want to become a priest either, to be very frank with you. So I was stuck in Aleppo, and my father started again his grumbles. It's to say, I told you that it's no good, you should go and earn money, you see, you are doing nothing, you are useless, this, that, the other, as all fathers 
say. I was getting fed up. At that moment, the door opened and someone brought a telegram. I opened the telegram and it said, you are invited to lecture at the Armenian College in Calcutta. Please answer immediately. I don't think in my life I've run so fast to the post office at that day. I never even asked what you're going to pay me. So I sent a cable, I said, please send my ticket. And in 1957, January, I arrived in Calcutta <coughs> to Dam Dam Airport at midnight. And on the way, I was amazed. I said, my God, all these cows around on the way. And where's the cowboy? I mean, how is he controlling it? Later on, I realized that there, there is no cowboy. These are sacred cows roaming all over the place and eating anything they want to eat. And another thing struck me first night when I arrived to Grand Hotel, uh, where the bus stopped. I saw thousands of people lying on the streets. And from the bus, I thought, I've just arrived. It would be my luck. I've just arrived uh, to a war zone or something. All these people are dead. Then I realized that, no, it wasn't the case, but these poor people did not have anywhere to sleep, and they had to sleep on that hard surface, semi-naked, and that was the first impression that shook me in India. Well, that's how I got to India. And if you're going to ask me the question as to how I had the misfortune of meeting my charming wife, I'll tell you that too. <laughs> well. In my contract, it stipulated that besides teaching at the college, I should also conduct the church choir. So I went uh, to rehearsals. I saw a young lady, quite pretty, I must say, conducting the choir. And they told her that now in future, uh, she has to play the organ and I have to conduct the choir. Well, that became my future wife. I had to get married very quickly, you know, because there isn't much pleasure in India. And little did I know I was going to meet my Waterloo <laughs> and get married to him Wasn't that it? same year. But for me, life in India was, uh, as he, you know, for me, I was so surprised when he used to mention those people sprawled uh, out on the pavement. It was, it probably didn't hit us people so much there because it was an everyday life, you know, you did have your... Uh, the poor people, the, the people that were begging, the people that were destitute. But my life was a very secure, steady, comfortable, peaceful life. My parents, both mother and father, they were born in Iran, but they both came over as youngsters with their parents and settled, of course. Life there was uh, very much like a big family. You know, every Armenian knew, knew each other and uh, life centered around the clubs you know, the gay life, and so one sort of took it all in one stride, and it didn't hit us as it did to a stranger, and particularly in Asadur's case. Asadur was the first one in our household to sort of insist that, gosh, you've got a cook, you've got a, a bearer, you've got a, a man that helps, as they called him, the masalchi, the cook's help, who did the washing up and peeling of uh, vegetables and what have you. The chauffeur was called driver, and the bearer that did the household chores, you know, he was called bearer, and with no name attached to him. So this really upset him a lot. I thought that uh, human beings have got an elementary right to be called something. Ahmed, Ali, Banerjee, Chatterjee, whatever it is. I used to tell them, at least give the man his right. Call him. If you want to get angry with him, say, Ahmed, come here. But no, it wasn't. And another thing that was very unusual for me was this. The first day I arrived there, an old man almost fell on his face. So I fell on my face with him, thinking that this is the way you wish in this country. I went to the principal. I said, how do you wish in this country? He said, you, you say salam. I said, but I said salam, but the man went down to his knees. So did I. He says, no, 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 don't do that. Don't do that. You lose your prestige. So eventually I, t I taught the servants, in the school at least, when they are going to wish me, they stand up and say salam, and that's all. You know, maybe my background has got to do something. I've gone in, uh, into so many injustices that I uh, reacted very strongly. For me, it was really something shocking. In fact, if I hadn't met Vivian, I was living after 15 days and coming back to Middle East and doing just labor work, anything I got. I never got used to it, but it got better slowly. You, you started to accept it in a, in a way, you know. That was the only way to, to carry on for the next few years. 
And uh, later on, of course, when the British left India, or they were pulling out at the time, my father could see the writing on the wall and he felt that we can't stay on here, you know, conditions were changing very rapidly and we could see no future, especially for the new generation. And it was then that he decided that having lived under the British, this is the life he would like to plan for us, as all Armenian fathers and mothers do plan for their children, wherever they may be. And uh, this is how we came to settle in England in 1964. Well, my father always said that uh, British people were great and that there was nothing on earth that could happen. Even sometimes if it rained very heavily, he said, I wonder if they experimenting something in London. So he attributed everything to them and he always used to tell us when we had English guests that you must be careful when they come to eat here. So after all, he said, they are superior and you got to watch how they are eating and you follow them. So I had this complex. In fact, this, this complex was given to everybody in the Middle East uh, that we thought that uh, British people were a superior race. So when I came to this country, it took me about five years to adjust myself to this situation that British people are just like any other people. Now I'm adjusted, don't worry. Actually, when I came, the most difficult thing for me was in this country to get a job. A London University would not accept my qualifications. They wouldn't give me a visa. In spite of my wife being a UK citizen, they said no. So I was stuck until I was invited here uh, by an Armenian who had a newspaper um, and he needed an editor. So uh, Home Office gave permission because they didn't have a qualified editor. So I became the editor of an Armenian monthly, which was called The Sun. Sun without page three. So this, of course, naturally went bankrupt uh, uh, after a year and a half. Uh, I was uh, again without a job. Then my good friend who owned um, a textile company very close uh, in Brentford area, he asked me to join his company. And uh, unfortunately, after four years, that company went bankrupt too. So then I became the manager of our guest house. We had a guest house in, in Knightsbridge. Well, I remember my father-in-law coming to the guest house and asking me often, uh, have you got any paying guests today? Because I used to give all the poor students free rooms there. <laughs> and I said, no, I'm afraid today we don't have any paying guests. So I remember him telling me one day, do you think we should sell this? Because this, after all, is not a benevolent institution. I said, I think you should have done it two years ago when I became the manager of this guest house. So we sold that one too. I also established um, a newspaper of my own for two years. That also went bankrupt. Whatever I touch, it seems quite bankrupt. And as someone rightly said, how is it then? The Armenians are good, good business people, but this particular one is not, I'm afraid. <laughs> so then I established my own export-import firm a year and a half ago. But this one won't go bankrupt because it hasn't got any capital anyway. It won't go bankrupt because I'm his secretary and I don't get any pay. <laughs> I'm the managing director. I don't get any pay either. <sighs> but um, we Armenians have got another quality. We can adopt ourselves. To any situation but in England we can adopt ourselves very easily because there's nothing to adopt yourself to we respect this country because this country respects our traditions we are a very small race uh, undergone through tremendous difficulties and that is what we teach our children to keep their identity not to betray the memory of their forefathers not to be chauvinist at all Armenians hate chauvinism but at the same time we are not inferior to any nation, but we are not also superior to any nation. We can speak equally uh, good English, not me personally, because mine is acquired. I've learned it by reading books. I never studied English in the school. We can speak maybe 10 languages, but Armenian must be one of those languages. And if our children do not speak Armenian, so we teach them the Armenian history. You see, um, Armenians have got a very ancient culture. Armenia uh, has been under Roman Empire, 
after that it's gone under the Arabs, then it fell to the Seljuks, Tartars, and eventually to the Ottoman Turks. And we lost our independence during the 11th century. And after that, we were dispersed all over the world. I mean, after all, uh, folklore reflects the history of a nation. If the history of a given nation is being said, so its folklore is said, its songs are said. And there is a song that every Armenian knows and every Armenian sings. It's called the Song of Crane. Now, as you know, cranes immigrate. They don't stay. They come at a certain time and they go. And they fly group by group. And here is an Armenian looking at the crane as far back as 16th century and feeling very nostalgic and thinking to himself that the crane is going to pass from Armenia. Oh, what a lucky crane. And he talks to the crane. He says, Krunk ustigukas tsarayem tsainit Krunk ach merashharen Habrik Merchunis, where are you coming from, O Crane? I am the servant of your voice. Tell me, Crane, haven't you got any news from my homeland? I suppose he visualizes that his wife, his children, are sitting there and singing the same song to the Crane. Well, it is a sad story, the story of the Armenians, but we've never lost our uh, optimism. We always also know how to create, by the way, the best jokes during the sad periods. Do you want to hear one of the Radio Armenia jokes? I heard this from the president of India in 1963 when I was interpreting for His Holiness in Delhi. He said, um, Somebody asked Radio Armenia, what is the difference between communism and capitalism? Radio Armenia said, well, he said, capitalism means exploitation of men by men. Well, he said, what about communism? Oh, he says, that's the reverse. 